Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Whoever you are, whatever your age, your skin color, whomever you love, wherever you are, whenever you are, as you watch this, know that you are welcome here and that we are so glad you are with us. It is good to be together. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom. And in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about throwing open the doors of this congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And as spring comes this year, vaccines are distributed, and we start to think about what comes next for this church, we're considering some big questions. What are our commitments? What are we becoming? What is our story? These are questions that define us and will continue to do so in the future. And churches are generational projects. But right now we don't have to look far into the future to ask what our next steps are. In these closing months of the pandemic, as we look to the future and plan our return to this building, we gather together in hope. There is work to be done, beloveds. Let's be about it. Welcome to all of you on this virtual Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us. As Oscar mentioned, we welcome you wherever you are. Although we may wish that we were all together in our sanctuary, some of us are not here in Lincoln. I particularly want to welcome those of you who would be unable to join us in our sanctuary, even if it were open. Some members of our congregation have joined us virtually during the winter from warmer parts of the United States. Some of you may be unable to join us in person due to health or mobility concerns. Some of you may even live thousands of miles away from Lincoln, Nebraska, but you have found a welcoming community with the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Welcome to you all. Our chalice lighting words this morning come from the Reverend Tess Baumgartner. From the busyness of every day, we gather once a week to remember who we are, to dream who we might become. We travel this road together. We share this journey across differences of belief and opinion. Today, as we take the next steps, let us notice our fellow travelers. And now, Chelsea Krafka, our Religious Growth and Learning Director, has a story for all ages. Our story today is called The Frank Show, and it is by David McIntosh. My granddad's name is Frank. Frank lives at our house, and he's always around. Frank talks about the way that things were when he was my age. He says, things were a lot tougher back then. Frank says that it was quite a lot quieter when he was my age. You could hear yourself think, he yells. My teacher has asked us to talk about one member of our family for show and tell on Friday. We can choose one person and talk for one minute about the things they like and what kind of person they are. 
I asked my mom if I can talk about her, but she says she is very busy and I should speak to my father when he gets off the phone. My dad says, uh, why don't you talk about Minnie, my sister? Minnie won't make a good subject to talk about. So I tell him I'll think about it. The only person left is Frank, but Frank is just a granddad. Frank always says, these days there are too many gadgets and gizmos. I prefer things the old fashioned way. Today I told my teacher that my mom was very busy and dad had a very long day. So the only person left in my family to talk about was Frank, my granddad. And she said, fabulous. But I don't know about that. At home, Frank says, he doesn't like fancy food. Plain and simple, that's me, he reckons. I wonder if there's anything about Frank that will make my talk interesting. On Tuesday at the shops, Frank says he only needs his haircut once a year and he doesn't trust barbers. He says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I can do without their input. And I just have mine tidied up. My friend Tom says that his uncle Marlon is a musician who plays the drums on the radio. Tom says he's allowed to bring his drumsticks on Friday. His uncle is cool. That night I ask Frank if he can play an instrument, maybe an electrical guitar. Frank says, today's music is just noise and you can't understand the words. He only likes listening to his music and he says, they don't make them like that anymore as he points to the record player. Barbara Bailey told me she is going to bring a color photo of her Nan's mobility scooter, her Nan's a retiree and secretary of a bowls club. Maybe I should take a color photo of Frank. That night I asked Frank why he doesn't drive a scooter or play bowls. Frank says, doctors speak a lot of gobbledygook and bowls is just dull as dishwater. He doesn't trust doctors as far as he can throw them, which isn't very far on account of his arm and one of his bad hips. Christian's dad is a comedian on TV who makes everyone laugh. Paolo's mom is Italian and knows all about Italian and can speak Italian. Faye's cousin tells you if your bag's too heavy at the airport. Donnie's dad works in a crisp factory. Saul's aunt swam the English Channel Hugh's stepbrother has a sports car with an eight ball gear knob. And my granddad's arm hurts when it's about to rain. I wish I could choose Tom. He's my age and I've known him since January. Tom carries a full deck of modern Marvel flashcards in his back pocket. And I'm the only other person that he lets hold them. He's smaller than me, but that doesn't matter when you're best friends. Tom asked me why I chose Frank for my talk because Frank's just a granddad. I don't know what to say. So now Tom and I aren't speaking. On the way home, I don't care if Tom thinks Frank isn't a good talk. Tom doesn't know Frank like I do and doesn't even live at my house with my family. So what does he know? But then he might be right because Everyone has something interesting to talk about and Frank is, well, just my granddad. My granddad doesn't always like the way things are and he always does things his way. He doesn't like noise or today's music or gadgets or gizmos or new things or haircuts or weather or doctors or any sort of ice cream that isn't vanilla. And today, I have to talk about him for a full minute. In class, everyone is excited. They've all spoken for a full minute about a member of their family, even Clive Martin. We all have to look out the window to see Hannah's mom's company car. Everyone in my class has something interesting to show and tell, but now it's my turn to talk about Frank. I tell them everything I know about Frank how Frank doesn't like noise or today's music or gadgets or gizmos or new things or haircuts or weather or doctors or anything but vanilla and about how everything was a lot tougher when he was a boy my age and that's it. I've run out of things I can say about Frank. And everyone's looking at me when 
Frank begins to tell a story about how he led an army in a charge across a muddy battlefield with bullets whistling all around like African bees and how the whole way he didn't miss a single note on his bugle except when an explosion made him play a sharp instead of a flat and how he gave his last drop of water to a thirsty horse and captured 100 enemy soldiers with nothing but his wit and brute force and how later he and his buddies had a green tattoo put on their arms to remember that day. Frank explains how he has a piece of metal left in his elbow from when he was in the war. And every time it's about to rain, I know because my arm goes numb. Sheldon Robe asks if getting a blurry tattoo hurt and Frank winks and says, you bet it did cowboy. Then we all have lunch. The kids sit around the table and they said things like, he's older than all of our birthdays added up. He has a rubber band ball that's 28 years old. He keeps a real Japanese sword under his bed. He can't smell anything because of his amateur boxing career. He keeps a folded $50 bill in his shoe and a double-headed coin in his hip pocket. He hasn't bought a new pair of pants in 10 years. And he can catch a fly with his bare hand and let it go. He has a special backup hearing aid that doesn't use batteries. He carries colored combs in his pocket and you can see them sticking up behind the pens. And everyone in the class cheered for my granddad, Frank. On the way home, Tom asks if he could visit Frank and me at our house one day. And I said, you bet you can cowboy. And that is the end of our story today. Each week, as part of our commitment to each other and this congregation, we take up a collection to support the work of this church and our partners in the community. As this next song plays, you're invited to text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. That's UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your support and your generosity. one of my favorites. It's so simple that I can pretend, at least to myself, that I can sing it. But more important to me than its simplicity are the first two lines in the fourth verse. Don't be afraid of some change. Don't be afraid of some change. Today I want to share with you and possibly challenge you with some ideas about change at both a universal and a personal level. I hope that you will also open your ears and open your hearts. Now each week we set aside time in our service to share the joys and sorrows of our lives. Our lives contain both celebration and grief. We should acknowledge both the uplifting 
and the discouraging aspects of life. Often during joys and concerns, we tend to focus on our sorrows. Right now, I encourage you to particularly consider the joys of your life, small and large. Think about what gives you comfort, delight, satisfaction, gratitude, or solace, as well as pain, sadness, disappointment, and difficulty. As the next hymn plays, you're invited to share in the Zoom chat box your name or the name of someone for whom you are carrying their joy or sorrow. reading this morning is a poem by Tim Haley titled Amid All the Noise in Our Lives. Amid all the noise in our lives, we take this moment to sit in silence, to give thanks for another day, to give thanks for all those in our lives who have brought us warmth and love, to give thanks for the gift of life, we know we are on our pilgrimage here, but a brief moment in time. Let us open ourselves here now to the process of becoming more whole, of living more fully, of giving and forgiving more freely, and of understanding more completely the meaning of our lives here on this earth. Our theme this month is becoming. In the Soul Matters materials distributed by the Unitarian Universalist Association, becoming primarily seems to be a personal or interpersonal process, a journey of individuals in congregation. But I wanna take a step back to get a much wider perspective before I talk about my pilgrimage and our pilgrimage together. I wanna to start by discussing whether God with a small g may be part of my pilgrimage, my process of becoming more whole. But I feel I should lay my cards on the table before we play this hand. I'm going to talk about God with a small g and about God with a capital G. This feels awkward for me because I have not believed in the commonly understood Christian God for decades. I generally believe that humans created and maintain God rather than the other way around. Right now, I don't believe in a self-aware, supernatural God who judges us or intervenes in our lives and our world. However, 
I'm willing to at least consider that I may be wrong. There may be some universal concepts that I and most other humans don't understand yet. When I look back at what humans believed a century or two in the past, I'm willing to concede that in the next few centuries, humans may discover aspects of the universe and of humanity that we can't even imagine today. I'm trying to keep my ears and heart open. So I'm willing to concede my ignorance and lack of imagination when it comes to the existence of a God or gods. But now let's move on to the topic of becoming. I'd like to begin with pre two brief quotations from Lao Tzu. First, if you realize that all things change, there is nothing you will try to hold on to. Second, life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Don't resist them. That only creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. Although our topic this month is becoming or undergoing change, we also have to consider being or the quality or state of having existence. The concepts of being and becoming seem to flow from one another, but philosophically they may be very different opposing perspectives. Since the ancient Greek philosophers through the enlightenment and to today, some philosophers and theologians have considered being as the key to understanding reality. Early philosophers were concerned with the definition of things that made up reality. When I say the words penguin or six, you picture in your mind those concrete and abstract things. My guess is that you picture a penguin as a black and white flightless bird that lives in Arctic climates. Penguins are real. They do exist as you picture them. However, they may also exist in the form of an egg or as a polar bear's lunch. The abstract thing six also seems clear, although it may also appear in the form 66 or 12. The reality of being seems to be simple and common sense. However, <clears throat> in the late 19th and early 20th century, philosophers began to describe reality as processes, not just static descriptions of things. Process philosophers described reality as a process of becoming. A thing could be described at a moment in time but they argued that the universe and reality underwent <clears throat> constant changes across a series of events. When I say the word chair, you may clearly picture a thing in your mind. However, that chair, that thing may only exist temporarily. Previously, it may have been a tree, and in a few years, it may become mulch. As Lao Tzu said, all things change. Now, <clears throat> process philosophy, primarily developed by Alfred North Whitehead in the early 20th century, 
argued that reality was constantly changing across three aspects. It was temporal. Reality was affected by the passing of time. It was mutable. The attributes of reality changed. It was passable. Reality was affected by the world. Again, Lao Tzu. Life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. Process philosophy seems to provide a more complete description of reality as becoming, not simply being. We may be uncomfortable due to the uncertainty of a constantly changing universe and reality, but if we try to pretend that we live in a static, stable universe, we may be constantly disappointed with reality. In the late 1920s, Charles Hartshorn, who had been a student of Whitehead's at Harvard, began developing the concept of process theology. He applied the three aspects of process philosophy to religion and more specifically to the concept of God. Hartshorn's process theology has given me a way to think about God that may be heretical, but it provides a glimpse of a God that seems closer to possibility. I want you to think about God for a moment. You may not have any faith in a God or your faith may be weak or strong, but I'd like you to join me in an exercise of the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I have three questions about God from the perspective of process theology. Even if you are a staunch atheist, I ask that you consider these questions about the popular general concepts of God. I think that we're in a safe enough space to conduct this thought exercise. However, some people, perhaps some of you, may find these questions blasphemous. When I began to discuss these questions with a Christian who I know well, I was firmly and angrily damned to hell for even asking them. Here are my three questions for your consideration. Does the passage of time affect God? Does God change? Is God affected by what happens in the world? These questions seem reasonable to me. It makes sense to me that if God exists as either a supernatural entity or as a creation of humanity, that God likely would be part of the processes of universal change over time. However, for some people, as a matter of firmly felt, held faith, God is eternal, immutable, and impassable. For these people, heart horns process theology, which suggests that God changes over time and is affected by humanity and worldly events, may actually be a framework of heresy. But for me, the concept of a God or gods that change over time makes more sense. I've been wrestling with the concept of God for many years. I do not now believe in a supernatural, self-aware, all-powerful God. But I'm not certain 
that that belief could never change. I accept that the universe changes. Who knows? Even I may change. How I think about God is part of my spiritual process of becoming. Right now, I don't think that I will ever become a faithful believer in a Christian God. But I may be more, become more aware about what I understand and believe. That's why I want to continue to read and think more about process philosophy and process theology. But what does all this mean when we talk about we are a people of becoming? At any time, who we are being could be described as a snapshot of our current reality. At any moment, I exist as a static thing that can be specified and described. However, our reality may be more like a motion picture, a series of events over time. Of course, we change over time due to natural processes of aging, but I would argue that we can also change our perceptions and behaviors. I try to look forward in time and make decisions and take actions to change my participation in the processes around me. I expect and welcome change. Perhaps that's why I am a progressive and an optimist. I believe that tomorrow will be better than today. I embrace change despite its uncertainty. I expect that we will take two steps forward, but only one step back. We can continue becoming perhaps until death, I don't believe that I am a static thing. I exist in time, I change over time, and I am affected by the world. I am part of the reality of universal processes. Oh, and in an interesting footnote, as I was researching this homily, I discovered that while Charles Harthorn was a professor of philosophy and a theologian at the University of Texas in Austin. He was also a member of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Perhaps not surprising. As the hymn says, open your ears, open your hearts, and don't be afraid of some change. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace, leave the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere. Yeah.